Well, welcome to this BC Strategies podcast. Uh, today, I'm thrilled to have BC Strategies expert uh, Joseph Williams. I guess technically, Doctor Joseph Williams. Like you have a doctor, and I think in what is that like management information and something science, right? Something uh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but I think more relevant to today, we're going to talk about cybersecurity. And I mean, you've had many roles in your uh, you know, esteemed kind of uh, career. Um, you've served as the practice lead and partner at Infosys, focusing on cybersecurity. Um, I know for many years you worked originally at, at Microsoft, and um, you know now you're the state of Washington information and communication technology sector lead, which is is, is a mouthful, but I. I imagine that um, cybersecurity is certainly something that uh, you know falls under that that role in that jurisdiction. So, so Joseph, thank you for being here. And um, I think you know, let's start by just like talking about you know. I think we know cybersecurity is super important, but we may not not all know. You know, how would you define cybersecurity? What is it? Yeah, thanks for that, Kevin. So I'm here not in my capacity working for the state of Washington, obviously. I'm here in my capacity as an analyst for BC Strategies. So cybersecurity is actually a very large field that encompasses what you would normally think of as protection. Safety and security is how most people describe it. But okay. protection, how do I protect my digital assets? Um, it also includes data privacy. Uh, how, how do I keep my data safe and secure, but also how do I keep it private and how do I keep it private in the right context? Um, because context matters. Cybersecurity includes compliance, compliance both with federal, state, provincial uh, regulations, as well as compliance with the uh, insurance. Uh, most companies have cyber insurance mm -hmm. and there are requirements, uh, compliance requirements for cyber insurance. There's also uh, compliance requirements if you're in someone's supply chain, like Walmart has very uh, stringent cybersecurity requirements for their supply chain. Um, and then the angle most people forget is there's a risk management side to cybersecurity. You cannot protect against everything. It's just not possible. It's not cost effective. So you're 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 going to guard against certain risks, and you're going to accept other risks. Well, you need to have people who understand risk, can manage risk, can put a quantification number on risk, and actually that's required in the U.S. now uh, for SEC uh, compliance. Speaking of compliance, you have to be able to assess your cybersecurity risk and what the impact would be to your business in the event of a ransomware or hack or something like that. So risk management very important. Um, part of this. And why we're talking about UC is largely most of the vendors out there don't really talk about security. And, and they tell you that their platforms are secure, but in fact, they're really not. And so you need to be informed. What are my risks if I am uh, deploying one vendor or another in, in, uh, in my environment? The other part of cybersecurity, there is a recovery aspect. What happens if I get hacked? How do I recover? And then there's a forensics angle. After I have recovered, how do I figure out what happened and, and what I needed to do going forward so it doesn't happen again or it doesn't happen so easily again, if that makes sense. Um, all right. So those are the. It's a big field. Big yeah. Field. No, that, I, I think that that's that's clear now. And and so you know you mentioned the unified communication vendors. Um, and then obviously the organizations, you know, we consume kind of these products that the, the vendors have, have brought to the market, these cloud-based, you know, for the most part, um, products. You know, overall, are the vendors and the organizations that are consuming these vendor offerings, are we collectively taking cybersecurity, um, you know, uh, are we are paying enough attention to it or... Well, as you, as you know, but probably the listeners of this, of this podcast don't know, I was part of the ship team for Microsoft Link. Right. And and in all the engineering meetings, we did talk about security. I mean, it, so this is 2010, right? So yeah. it's not that nobody knew about this. Um, there had been hacks uh, back in the PBX days, which were well known and, and you know, 
Microsoft and Cisco and everybody in this space was aware of those and, and uh, we're trying to come up with ways to protect against these hacks. The problem is the more secure you are, the more you impact performance, ease of use. You know, it's a trade-off. It it yeah. yeah, it goes back to that risk management thing. Okay. And I can't really disclose what Microsoft did in terms of, of those trade-offs, but they made them. I will just tell you, they, they had to make trade-offs and they did. Okay. And, you know. Now, there's a lot of different... Product. Yeah, no, so there's a lot of different, you know, areas of vulnerability. Um, can you just kind of maybe classify big groupings of vulnerability that people should be aware of when they're looking at this broad cybersecurity? Absolutely. So good segue. First big category and an obvious one is data privacy. So you're in the collab tool, the UC tool. And you have video and text and chats and, and collaboration rooms and everything. And you're yep. sharing probably sensitive and proprietary information. So you have corporate valuable information that's sitting in a repository that is accessed internally uh, by people who may or may not really have a need to see it, right. um, but potentially being shared with external parties. And so how do you protect that data? What do you do for that? I can tell you quite a few best practices are um, data doesn't sit there for more than three days. So mm -hmm. they, they, they trim everything you know, right. three to seven days after it's in the channel. So they don't have to worry about uh, e-discovery or things which will happen uh, in the event of a bad uh, uh, situation. So that's one thing on the data privacy side. A second thing, you might remember Zoom bombing from the beginning of yeah. COVID, where people would just show up on calls because these numbers were being kind of randomly distributed. Now, the industry's gotten better um, about preventing Zoom bombing because it actually produced some really horrible um, outcomes. Uh, right. But uh, Zoom bombing or, or the invitation of people, inadvertent invitation of people who don't belong is a real problem. You could imagine bunch of attorneys at a law firm handling a merger uh, in a Zoom call or a Teams call, and then somebody enters who shouldn't be there, and now you've got an insider trader problem, trading yeah. problem, and all kinds of legal issues, right? A third part of data privacy, you might remember about 2020, during the, uh, the heyday of, of uh, COVID, when UC was really taking off, it turned out that some vendors like Zoom were asserting an absolute right to use user data any way they want, uh, which in today's era could mean they mine it for AI. They right. use your data to train their model and do discovery on what you're doing. And so you still have to pay a lot of attention to the T's and C's of what you're signing in your end user licensing agreement in terms of how your vendor can use um, your data. And if you're using open source products where there may be no control over uh, um, how, how the data is being used, that would be an area perhaps of uh, big concern. So that's yeah. one, data privacy, this whole thing around data privacy. There have been some pretty well documented uh, si uh, situations where uh, very valuable IP was leaked uh, through a collaboration platform and caused serious harm uh, to a company. Yeah, and I should just, I just do want to interject because I'm working on the AI and collaboration session for Enterprise Connect. And just to be clear, uh, Zoom and Cisco with WebEx and Microsoft Teams, um, they have now come out and very clearly said, we're absolutely not going to use your customer data, right? So exactly. I, mean, I, think, I think, yeah, for sure, review the T's and C's, but I think that there were a few uh, missteps where uh, they wrote, as you said, back in 2020, uh, too broad of rights to customer data. And now, you know, they're all being very, especially in this age of AI, saying we're not training our models on customer data. But to your point, Joseph, yeah, review the T's and C's and make sure that that's the case when you're listening to this. Oh, not to get too nuanced here, Kevin, but actually, if you read what they're saying is they right. won't use your direct data, but they could actually uh, use some data vaulting, privacy vaulting 
okay. where they can't trace it back to you specifically, but they use your data anyway in, in a safe harbor kind of fashion. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. That's very technical. No, no, but I think I think your point is, yeah, definitely have, you know, you need to review this because whether it's metadata or whatever it is, make sure you understand, you know, what they're using and how you're using how they're using it and make sure you're okay with it. Right? So. Exactly. All right. Second okay. category, corporate protection. So it turns out, what a shocker, people do really bad things and they can <laughs> use your platform for uh, sexual harassment. They can use your platform for deliberately stealing your IP. They could use your platform for leaking your IP. Um, they could use your platform for insider trader planning and things like that. So you need to think about that. You need to think about how you're um, going to manage that risk and uh, what that ends up looking like. I can tell you there's some new indication. I was just reading the National Law Review. Uh, it may be that a single instance of harassment is all that's needed now to uh, pursue a case of sexual harassment against a corporation. That's, you know, people say bad things in these in these meetings and suddenly it's recorded and available right. to everybody. Anyway, that's one. Second thing is there are still some collaboration platforms that allow unauthorized users to join a meeting, right? Uh, WebEx had a horrible problem with that in 2020. They fixed it. Um, but um, Zoom had that problem. Teams had that. Everybody has had these problems. They continue to fix that. Um, but if people circulate your credentials, um, in a way that's not permissible by maybe forwarding the meeting invite or doing things like that, you could end up having um, unauthorized people joining your meeting. And a lot of uh, platforms allow you to have someone dial in and all right. it shows is the phone number and doesn't identify who the people are. And so you got to be careful about that. Uh, by the way, the fix on that is everybody must identify themselves and whoever is managing the session removes anybody who isn't authorized, but you can also uh, uh, deep fake that as well. Right. A third problem under corporate protection, less critical than it was a couple of years ago, is theft of services, which is where people are using these platforms for unauthorized calling. Mm -hmm. um, there are some instances where these platforms have been used to run sex rings and things like that. And, um, uh, but it used to be that these call termination fees were pretty significant and and uh, people were using them to call their friends and family all over the world or they were selling access numbers and things like that less of a problem but still something that you want to uh, take a look at third category and this is the bad one okay. is the malware category where where uh, threat actors are injecting bad code or they're injecting malware and as a result, um, you actually are um, using the platform is being used as a way to get inside your firewall and do crazy things. And so just in the last year, uh, there were research security researchers uh, figured out how to bypass Teams's client side security controls to send uh, uh, files uh, to external tenants. That's actually a pretty serious a security violation. In 2023, hackers uh, substituted a malware called Iced ID for real Zoom upgrades. So you, you would go and you would go to an open source site that you thought was providing you a Zoom upgrade or you would be teased by an ad uh, to click on something that would be a, a Zoom upgrade. And in fact, it just uh, it installed the Iced ID uh, malware and gave uh, root control access or uh, unprotected arbitrary code execution access you know, into the platform. Uh, last year also, I'm not, I'm not picking on any one particular platform because I've mentioned Microsoft and Zoom. Let's go to WebEx. WebEx had the Batloader malware distributed. That was a very clever uh, uh, distribution, probably came from Mexico where you would do a Google search on WebEx and they right. would show show you an outcome that pointed you to a fake WebEx download portal. And then you would click on it and it would install the bat loader mm. uh, malware, uh, which was very, very sneaky. And uh, uh, Cisco, uh, you know, 
put out security bulletins on that right away, but still people fell um, victim to it. There was another Cisco bill uh, bug revealed this month. It's a 9.9 .9 on the 10 point scale um, that allows execution of arbitrary code um, in, in the WebEx platform and in the contact center platform um, that is pretty serious and um, that's being resolved uh, uh, as we speak. Um, so that's just, you know, your primary platforms each have had a problem in the last year. There's the ongoing problem of denial of service attacks. You might remember that uh, uh, Governor DeSantis tried to launch his presidential campaign on Twitter. Right. Uh, the, the platform failed. One of the theories is the platform didn't really fail, but the hackers got a hold of, of, of the uh, degraded the platform through denial of services uh, that just degraded the um, the operation of that announcement in such a way that it ended up being a really bad uh, look for the governor. And um, that happens, right? It's just, it's part of the reality that's out there is these platforms uh, run over the top on internet, on the internet, and it's not impossible to actually degrade their performance so that you end up with a bad outcome, so. Yeah, and I think if you flood, like, I mean, people, I've talked about even if you flood the emergency lines or the phone lines going into a hospital or, I mean, it's like you're just, so now the real service can't go through. Like, as you said, like whether it's Twitter or Teams or WebEx or, I mean, people just now flood it. And it's, it's in some ways, it's not super sophisticated. In fact, it's just really a brute force of attack, right? But I mean, the net result is, the service is either degraded or unavailable for you know the real purposes. That's right. And because of the way distributed computing works, you get these botnets where you can have a million or two million computers right. actually starting to ping the service in a way that denies it, which is why it's called denial of service yeah. <laughs> or distributed denial of service. Yes. So that's the big, I mean, we've talked about data privacy, corporate protection, right. malware. Um, easy peasy uh, for hackers to, to uh, fish, uh, mm. do phishing attacks. Um, and there's tools out there. Here's the crazy part. These hackers actually develop a methodology and a framework, and then they build a tool, and then they market the tool and franchise it. And there's a whole economy here. Right. So there's a, a hacker group called TA543. Um, they created a, a, a tool called Teams Fisher, so it, it ex exploits some uh, flaws that Microsoft didn't feel necessary to patch, um, and it made it relatively easy for anybody to uh, fish uh, uh, people who are on the Teams platform into giving up their uh, credentials. Um, there was... Uh, Cozy Bear, uh, which is a Russian hacker group, right. uh, compromised Microsoft 365 last May uh, through a program Microsoft calls Midnight Blizzard, or in their own references, called Midnight Blizzard. And uh, that really was just designed to help people help to entice people to give up their credentials. Mm. And it would be fake MFA. It would be fake uh, uh, re-entering of credentials. There's all kinds of ways to fish and entice people uh, because largely you're trying to get into a meeting really fast and you're not really paying attention. I can't tell you the number of times I've tried to enter a Zoom call and, and I get a message that Zoom needs to update before it'll let me into the call. And at that point, how, how diligent can I be? Or right. am I just hitting accept because I need to get you're already late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so the phishing people are super sophisticated. They've gotten so much better. They're, it's not emails from a Nigerian prince anymore. These are very, very clever, um, uh, what I would call uh, enticements with substitutions of platforms that you're used to. Um, and, and you know, you're, you're used to seeing the Cisco download portal uh, for upgrading uh, your client. And if somebody does substitute portal, how would you even know? Right. You know, there are some ways to protect yourself on that. But anyway, it's still a big problem. So fourth category is phishing. And yep. then there, there's some other things which uh, 
again, hacker tools, or I call them hacking tools, fifth category. So those of you who remember SIP, there's a, a hacking tool called SIP Vicious, and SIP Vicious scans the networks and identify every SIP server that's out there. And then you can use SVWAR uh, to identify any PBX extensions that you want. And then you can use SVCrack to actually get two passwords. That's what existed in the old PBX world, which kind of still exists out there. Right. Um, they have similar tools in the UC world where you basically, you break down each of the things you need to do in order to hack a network or a, a service like Teams or Zoom. And then, you know, you subdivide it, improve it, put it in the open source community. These things, you know, they, they're sitting in um, uh, repositories of code that, that hackers can get access to. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, kind of threat, uh, kind of seriously concerning, I guess. But, but, and, and I think you bring up a good point because I think, you know, a lot of people still have this image of a hacker as being like a disgruntled teen or, or adult sitting in their parents' basement, um, you know, going out and doing this. But I mean, this, to your point, this is commercialized. I mean, this is, you know, this is sometimes nation state sponsored. So these are incredibly sophisticated tools used by incredibly sophisticated, you know, groups of Ten hundred, I guess, maybe thousands of kind of bad actors who are working in concert. Is that is that a uh, accurate? That is kind of? accurate, and it's important to remember there's almost no consequence to hacking because if you're in Pakistan or Belarus or Russia, you're not going to get arrested or extradited. Even if you get a red ticket, unless you're traveling, nothing's going to happen to you. Right. So, um and, and this is very lucrative um some of the ransomware that's out there results in 25 million dollar payouts not canadian either u.s payout. <laughs> yes i'm based i'm sitting just outside toronto so in, in real <laughs> dollars right so there you go okay so, so all right so the, what can you do what yeah can you that's do? what i was gonna say you you painted a bit of a bleak picture so Okay, so other than throwing my hands up, uh, yeah, so what what can you, what should the people listening to this think about that they can do for themselves and their organizations? So first thing, do not accept the default configurations and settings of your UC platform. Okay. So when, whether you're implementing it from the cloud or on-prem, you have the ability to tune what you want done, and you really need to think through, you need to have a group studying. Here's each of the tuning parameters. Do I want to trim the chat log after three days? Do I want to allow external file transfers? Do I want, and, and you know, so you need to think about these settings, what they mean to your company. And then uh, it, it turns out in some cases you deprecate the platform so it's not as useful, but it's more secure. So what's the trade-off? Right. And how are you going to do that? Um you can also, Microsoft and Cisco and Zoom all release security bulletins with some sort of guidance as to what they think best practices are. And so almost everybody has a UC platform of some kind already, but, but I, would, I would still go back and take a look at, well, what did we do and why didn't okay. we do it? You should always do an annual review of these anyway. Um, if you, if, your unified communications platform is considered business critical. It should be going through some sort of SOX, Sarbanes-Oxley like review every yeah. year anyway. And so these are good questions to ask uh, relative to the configuration. I know because I used to work for an Indian offshore company, people tend to configure and forget, but that's really bad for security. Well, especially so, if you deployed it in a rush, it's like when you're rushing to your meeting, but if you deployed your UC platform in a rush as you, you know, people were forced of COVID by COVID to go work from home. And if you haven't reviewed the settings that you picked at the time, yeah, you absolutely should do that kind of governance review now, right? Yep. Also, I've noticed that some companies will have a primary platform. So their primary platform is WebX, let's say. But okay. they also use Zoom and Teams. 
And right. so their primary focus is on the one platform and not the secondaries. So mm. you really have to secure all of your EC platforms, including Slack or anything yep. else that you're using, right? Yeah. So, so that's the first thing. Second, okay. oh my gosh, keep your patches current. Right. You know, as as Cisco discovers these flaws, as Microsoft discovers these flaws, they they issue patches or yeah. workarounds or something. And so you need to keep on top of, of the maintenance bulletins and you need to have a program for how you update these. And patching is time consuming and expensive. I totally get it. Um, you have to update your run books and everything, but it needs to be done. Right. And, and not doing it is is accepting a risk you probably don't need to accept. Uh, a third thing, I think you should tightly control who and what is allowed to join a meeting. And you need to have principles and standards for that. You know, who gets to join a meeting? Okay. Uh, can't just be everybody. <laughs> Or maybe it could. Depends on your culture, right? Right. Uh, so that's a problem. You have to train your employees to be vigilant. I mean, how many employees will sit there, take a look at the roster, and say, "Wait a minute, who's this person? What are, what are they doing?" Or or right. how many of them understand that something that they type into a chat box actually uh, becomes legally discoverable in a lawsuit? You know, these kinds of things. So training right. is important. You have to train your security operations center, your SOC, on uh, what to be aware of in terms, in, in case alerts. So what happens in the cybersecurity world is you have all these uh, automatic tools that are monitoring everything. And if they see something that's wrong, they issue an alert. The alert may or may not go to the SOC for remediation or attention or whatever. You need to train the SOC to understand Certain vulnerabilities in the unified communication space are riskier and more critical, like an external file transfer that needs to be reviewed, as opposed to somebody putting up a GIF right. or, you know, uh, installing a, a polling software or something like that. So although that could be bad, too. But the SOC needs to understand the unified communications, and they, they don't. I mean, my experience of running a cybersecurity practice is uh, the SOC folks have a, have a limited awareness of uh, what is risky in the UC mm -hmm. platform. I don't know why, Kevin, but it appears that web browser, joining a meeting in a web browser is just flat out safer than joining it using the app. Oh, interesting. So, because it's more of a sandbox, security sandbox. So if you right, join right. A, a Zoom meeting or a, a Teams meeting from the browser, According to the security researchers, that provides you more security than if you join through the app itself. Hmm. Yeah, and that kind of when you say it, although I, I would have naturally picked the other way, but now that I think about it, as you say, the web browser is more of a sandbox, right? So if you write a web app, I put on my software development hat, you know, you, you're limited. You can't really access the file system in the same way when you're running as a native desktop app. I mean, you can pretty much do whatever you want. So if I, if a malicious code gets into the native desktop app, it has a lot more privileges kind of with the, the whole operating system, right? So interesting. Exactly. exactly. So uh, that all said, I get lazy and join through the app uh, more than I should. I, I, right. uh, but, you know, a lot and a lot of the uh, apps like Google Meet are, are, are browser based anyway. So uh, for whatever that's worth. All right, so that's things you can do. Okay. Um, where do you go to get information? Now, historically, this is not a new field. Uh, the, <laughs> for, the Dan York published a book in 2010 on the seven deadliest unified communications attacks. Okay. In 2010, it's right. still relevant in terms of categories. The specific things he was talking about are a little out of date now, but but uh, 2010. Uh, Ten years ago, Collier and Endler wrote a book on hacking UC and, and VoIP uh, and, and uh, uh, more relevant because by then uh, 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 Link had been out, WebEx had been out. And so there's more of a UC uh, component as opposed to a PBX component uh, to their book. But they're still relevant today. If you go back and you read them, you, you'd say, oh, my gosh, we haven't really fixed these problems, have we? 
it's not great, but okay. <laughs> now, where do I get my information? So I get my information from securityaffairs.com, okay. uh, which issues stories and bulletins. They were one of the first to break the Cisco problem this month. Um, I get my, uh, I always pay attention to the hackernews.com uh, because that's, again, a great story for it. Right. Uh, but I also, I also track all the vendors. So I have uh, each one of the major vendors issues alerts. I get those sent to me. Um, in a feed, and I pay attention to them. Obviously, if I was the team's lead for a very big Fortune 500 company, I would be getting those bulletins anyway. Um, right. But I, uh, through the maintenance program, right? But I would pay attention when it's also coming out um, yeah, through their other channels. Uh, what I don't see, I haven't been to Enterprise Connect in years, but I don't see any venues at that event where they talk about cybersecurity. And so part of what needs to happen is the industry, I think, needs to start taking this more seriously. Uh, there'll be sessions on AI, I guarantee you that. But will there be sessions on cybersecurity? Probably not. So, yeah. much. so, so a couple of things. I'll make sure that we post the links to some of the resources that you talked about, along with kind of this, this video. And then because you brought up AI, and maybe this is for a whole, whole other podcast, but just like briefly, you know, is AI making cybersecurity, is it make us more secure or less secure? Because, you know, you talk about deep fakes and denial of service attacks and creating, you know, content that looks like it's real, like obviously generative AI can do those things that bad actors can use. But then you talk about, you know, there are other cybersecurity vendors that are using AI to monitor these trillions of security signals, right? So. On balance, is both. this a good or bad thing? It, okay. it, it's both. I will tell you, I, you know what video looping is, right? Where yeah, yeah. You, you record a video of yourself and you don't really log into the call. You just loop the video so people think you're there. Yeah, and, and every every crime, uh, whatever, all the oceans, 12, 11, 15, you know, every, every kind of movie, they always do that video looping when they're sneaking in so yes but okay so the way i would get into a meeting that i don't belong to is i would use deep fake technology to create a video loop of somebody who belongs in the meeting right and then i would just be there and participating and nobody would pay attention because they would think that i'm kevin keeler uh, yep, yep. In, in the meeting right uh, that's so easy to do today yeah um uh, now can we guard against that? Yeah, there's actually technology out there that would detect that. You can detect a video loop, um, but are the products offering those services yet? No. No. Um, and so we're going to get there. It, it's going to be uh, kind of a uh, hide the cheese uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> adventure uh, with AI. AI makes, I think, attack easier, and I know it makes defense easier. But it adds okay. expense and it adds overhead. And uh, so that's where you at. By the way, the final resources, the critical vulnerabilities are all posted to the CVEs. And you should always go onto the CVE sites. Like in the US, it could be CISA, CISA, which is the okay. Homeland Security Agency. Right. You just type in your vendor and see what CVEs have popped up. Uh, there's also an international CVE registry. Uh, so. They number them all uniquely through a central authority. Um, but uh, CVEs are important. And uh, typically, not only do you get the vulnerability, but you get what the vendor response uh, to that vulnerability is going to be. Okay. So anyway, well, that's, kind of, that's kind of the whole landscape. I, I think the critical thing, we, uh, you know, if 30% of corporate communications is happening through a collaboration platform, you can't ignore this. You, you really, I mean, you want to trust your vendor to have kept everything secure, but that's not a very bright way to go. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the takeaways that I hear is that, you know, I mean, there are all these different sources of information, but, you know, the IT pros, there has to be people, that, you know, that are dedicated to reviewing this, like bulletins that nobody reviews, uh, provides no value. And then I, I, you know, and I wonder, like it's great if you're a multinational and you've got a big IT kind of you know department, but you know for a smaller or medium-sized organization, 
um, if, you know, it, it sounds a little challenging, you know, for the IT people or person often um, to be able to even make sure that the settings other than the default settings offered by the vendor are, you know, balancing the risk versus the vulnerability for the organization. So, so I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. The small businesses rely on the vendor for cybersecurity because, right. you know, if you're a $35 million business, your IT budget doesn't give you what it takes to hire a chief information security officer. You just can't afford it. Right. So you're going to rely on your vendors. And NIST, which is the federal agency in the U.S., which helps with security standards, has just recently sm spun up a small business group to focus on small business. Okay. Because they are vulnerable. And, and, yeah. and you know, the, the guy who, or the woman who runs eight machine shops in Toronto isn't yeah. going to have a cybersecurity expert. They're going to just buy Teams or buy WebEx yeah. and, and rely on it. And what else can they do? And, and that's what NIST is focused on. NIST is wondering, well, what else can you do? Right. So No, and it's, it's interesting. So I'm going to, after this, I'm going to go and look at the Enterprise Connect uh, sessions and, and do a search for security or cybersecurity and see, you know, if there are. I know if I had, to your point, if I search for AI, that's going to be every session. Um, but, you know, this especially for the medium, the small and medium size, you know, maybe there really needs to be more discussions um, targeted at the vendors, right, for these smaller organizations, because as you say, they rely on the vendor. So um, I know the vendors are trying to do the right thing, but, um, you know, maybe there needs to be a little more emphasis than right now that they're, you know, they're, they're putting all their emphasis on AI. Maybe we need to just... Uh, have a few more discussions and make sure that they're paying enough attention. If I hadn't been doing a job change, I would have uh, asked Eric to uh, create a, a cybersecurity session and flown down and done it, but I just didn't have time this year, but it needs to be done. <laughs> no, that, that's a, a very good point and probably a great place to, uh, to leave this. Joseph, thank you for your time. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with the BC Strategies Group, it is a group of elite independent consultants and analysts with deep expertise in a whole bunch of different areas, as I think, you know, Joseph demonstrated with his deep expertise in, in cybersecurity. Um, thanks for your time and uh, great discussion today. Thanks, Kevin.